Now, Anison, the tablets thousands of physicians and dentists recommend for fast relief of pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia, and heat, the liniment that's strong yet does not burn, present our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. It's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks Transcribed. But first, if you suffer from the pains of a headache, we urge you to try the remarkable product this program features, Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. The relief these tablets bring is not only effective, but often incredibly fast. Many of you I know first discovered Anison through your own dentist or physician. But if you have not yet used Anison, we urge you to try these tablets the next time you are in pain from a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Try Anison on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want, as fast as you want it, return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison at any drug counter. It's A-N-A-C-I-N. Easy to take Anison tablets come in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. Well, the majority of our public schools start their fall semesters tomorrow, but our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, decided to go back last Friday. At breakfast, her landlady asked the reason. Why are you going down to school this morning, Connie? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Davis. There are several reasons, I guess. I like to get my desk in order and see that the blackboards are all clean and ready. Uh, besides, I won't be the only teacher at school this morning. A certain biology laboratory has to be put in shape for the coming term, too. Mm, I see. And there's a certain biology teacher going to do the putting in shape? That's right. A certain male biology teacher? Mm-hmm. A certain male biology teacher named Philip Boynton? <laughs> I might have known. <laughs> you get a different look when you just start thinking of him. A sort of golden light floods your eyes at the mention of his name. It's like somebody stuck a fork into two poached eggs. <laughs> <laughs> what a pretty thought, Mrs. Davis. But I am fond of the bashful brute. Oh, pass the cream, please. Um, here you are, dear. Thanks. Oh, may I have the sugar, please? Here it is. If only he'd come out of his shell. He's so retiring. He doesn't seem to realize how handsome and charming he now, is. Now, now, please, Connie, stop thinking about Mr. Boynton. It's preventing you from eating a proper breakfast. What? What makes you say that? You've just drunk a cup of sugar and cream without <laughs> coffee. <laughs> well, no wonder it tasted so sweet and white. But there's something else that's been on my mind lately. I ran into some teachers the other day, and there's a rumor that some changes are going to be made in our faculty. Oh, nonsense, Connie. These silly rumors start flying around before every new term. Why, down at the Ladies' League luncheon the other day, I even heard that Mr. Conklin might be leaving Madison. What? But without Mr. Conklin as our principal, Madison wouldn't be... Well, it just wouldn't be a high school anymore. What would it be? A paradise. <laughs> I mean, who told you about his leaving? Nobody told me. It was just mentioned in passing, along with a lot of other scuttle, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, but. <laughs> what a charming colloque, if you'll excuse the expression, queerism. <laughs> I guess I'll find out more about the situation at school today. Walter Denton's driving me down this morning. Oh, what's wrong with your car? I had a little trouble with the drive shaft yesterday. What happened to it? It fell down an open manhole. It was nice of you to pick me up this morning, Walter. It is a labor of love, oh fair one. Besides, I promised to help Harriet Conklin get things straightened out at school. Oh, is Harriet coming in today, too? Yes, ma'am. I'm picking her up on our way down. She always likes to help old Marblehead, uh, I mean, her dad, get things ready before school officially opens. Yes, I know, but how come she isn't driving down with him? There are cars in the repair shop. The bottom of the motor's all ripped up. Seems some idiot left a drive shaft sticking out of an open manhole. <laughs> well, it's 
takes all kinds of drivers to make a world, don't I? Uh, how's Mr. Conklin been acting lately, Walter? Oh, awful. Even for him. Harriet told me yesterday he's been tense and irritable all week long. Well, that's par for the course, isn't it? What do you suppose he's worried about? You got me. All I know is that with the school term starting on Monday, he'll probably make our lives a... Walter. Inferno's the word I had in mind. Well, that's a little cooler. <laughs> now, here's the house, Miss Brooks. <laughs> I'll go up on the porch and get Harriet, Miss Brooks. You wait right here. All right, Walter. Tell Harriet to hurry. It's almost a quarter after Boynton. A ten. <laughs> Hi, Walter. You timed it just right. Hi, Harriet. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. Good morning, Walter. It's very sweet of you to call for Harriet like this. It's a labor of love, Mrs. Conklin. Is old Marble... <laughs> Is Mr. Conklin going with us? Well, I don't know if he's quite ready, Walter. Uh, just a moment, I'll call him. Oh, I'm good. Do you want to ride down to school? Who's driving? I am, Mr. Conklin. Me, sir. Me, Walter Denton. Me, walk. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just as well. Daddy's been in a pretty bad mood lately. The walk will do him good. Okay, let's get started, Harriet. See you later, Mrs. Conklin. Bye, Mother. I'll be back as soon as I help Daddy get Madison organized. All right, dear. Have they gone? Yes, Osgood. Good. There's something I'd like to tell you about, my dear. Something I wouldn't want blabbed all over town. Oh, now, Osgood, that's no way to talk about your own daughter. Harriet never gossiped. I was not referring to Harriet. I'm talking about her idiot consort. <laughs> if there ever was a marble head, it's that boy. <laughs> However, what I wanted you to know is that your husband, Osgood Conklin, principal, may soon be Osgood Conklin, assistant supervisor of schools in this area. No. Well, it's not definite, of course. As a matter of fact, I just read of my predecessor's transfer. But it shouldn't take the board long to pick out his successor. Do you really think you've got a chance, Osgood? Chance? What other principal has a better chance? The job requires tact, charm, diplomacy... And intelligent. Do you really think you've got a chance, Osgood? <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you are selected, when will you find out about it? Probably within the next few days. That's why I'm going into school today to clean up my office top to bottom. Never know when the head of the board might drop in. Oh, but that suit you've got on. It's practically in tatters. Well, what do you expect me to wear around dirty desks and dusty files? My frock coat... Now, if you'll excuse me, my dear, I'll trot along to school. Well, don't walk too fast, dear. Remember what Dr. Frank said. While you're on your diet, you mustn't exercise too strenuously. Dr. Frank. It's Dr. Frank's fault that I've got to take off all this weight. Well, what do you mean? Well, if he hadn't cleared up my ulcer three years ago, I'd never have gotten so stout. <laughs> well, well, food isn't everything. Oh, before you go, dear, I'd like to ask a favor. Yes? Lucy Snodgrass phoned a little while ago and told me her washing machine is broken. Naturally, I offered to put her laundry in with ours this afternoon. Well, that should make our laundry very happy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? Well, Stretch Snodgrass, Lucy's boy, is coming down to school today to clean up the gym. He'll put the bundle in your office, and I'd like you to bring it home for me. A charming assignment. <laughs> well, I'm leaving, Martha. Uh, you may kiss me now. Thank you, dear. At ease. <laughs> well, here we are at school. Dear old Madison. Oh, it's just heavenly to see your ivy-covered walls once again. Steady, girl, steady. <laughs> you know, school isn't so bad when you just volunteer to come. I'd better get right into Daddy's office and start cleaning up. What's your hurry, kids? It's a beautiful day. Why don't we sit out here in the sun together and chat for a while? If you say so, Miss Brooks. Oh, good morning, folks. Mr. Boynton. So long, kids. Come on. You can give me a hand with the closet. You okay, my sweet? Adios, dear teachers. Goodbye, Walter. Well, Miss Brooks, are you all ready to plunge into another school semester? All I've got to do is hold my nose and jump in. <laughs> 
about you, Mr. Boynton? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. But I have heard some rather disturbing rumors lately. Rumors? Yes. I heard that there's going to be some kind of a shake-up in the faculty this term. I hope it doesn't affect any of the teachers I know. Like whom, Mr. Boynton? Well, like Mr. DeWitt or Mr. Norman or Miss Enright. Oh. Of course, I didn't mention the one person whose dismissal would affect me the most. And whose is that? <laughs> Mine. <laughs> well, I couldn't afford to stay out of work for any length of time. It would work a considerable hardship on my family. They'd have to send me even more money than they do now. My goodness. To hear you talk, anyone would think you were some kind of helpless moron instead of a brilliant, handsome, personable, capable scientist. Who, me? Yes, you. That's the way you should consider yourself always. What do you suppose would happen if you lost your job here at Madison? Do you think you'd have to pack your clothes in a bindle and become a hobo? Do you think you'd have to shuffle through life like this, this poor tramp coming toward us? Well, no, but... I should say you wouldn't. Why, you... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Boynton. I just got to give this poor old bum a few cents. Uh, here you are, my good man. Get yourself a bowl of hot soup. No, thanks. <laughs> I just had breakfast. Mr. Conklin. Oh, please forgive me, sir. I, I didn't recognize you in that old suit. <laughs> I am wearing it because I have a lot of cleaning up to do today. Uh, of course, sir. Miss Brooks didn't mean to uh, No, she never does. Uh, now, you'll excuse me? Oh, here you are, Daddy. I found this bundle of laundry in your office. Know anything about it? Yes, yes, Harriet. It belongs to Mrs. Snodgrass. I'm taking it home to your mother this afternoon. Now, for heaven's sake, let's get into school and clean out my desk. Yes, Daddy. See you later, folks. All right, Harriet. Did you hear that, Mr. Boynton? He's going in to clean out his desk. And those old clothes he was wearing. And taking laundry home to his wife. He must be the one who's been canned. Uh, dismissed. Seems to add up, all right. Poor Mr. Conklin. How could the board do such a thing? All these years as a principal and suddenly... You know, Mr. Conklin has irritated me on occasion, but if he's actually out of a job, well, it's hard to hate a man when he's down. This may not sound like me, Mr. Boynton, but I'm going to do everything in my power to show Mr. Conklin I'm behind him. What are you going to do, Miss Brooks? I'm going right in and help him clean out that office. <laughs> Friends, when you suffer torturous pain from rheumatism, muscle strain, or backache, you want relief fast. That's the time to reach for heat. H-E-E-T. Heat. The liniment that's strong, yet does not burn. The moment you apply it, you can feel heat, soothing warmth, working to relieve your painful miseries. That's because heat penetrates deep, brings immediate relief to sore, aching muscles. Wherever you ache, just brush on heat. Heat penetrates deep keeps working for hours to bring wonderful, soothing comfort to the painful, aching area. Your pain seems to disappear. Heat isn't oily, sticky, or messy. You just brush on heat with a handy applicator that comes with each bottle, and it dries in seconds. So remember, when pain of rheumatism, muscle strain, or backache makes you miserable, heat's penetrating warmth gives you fast, long-lasting relief. Get heat, H-E-E-T, heat, the liniment that penetrates deep, to bring immediate relief. Well, Miss Brooks was practically convinced last Friday that Mr. Conklin had lost his job as principal of Madison High. But knowing what a proud man he is, she refrained from mentioning it and spent the morning getting her classroom in order for the fall semester. About noon, she and Mr. Boynton headed for Marty's Malt Shop across the street. But tell me, Mr. Boynton, have you confirmed our suspicions about Mr. Conklin's dismissal? No, I haven't. I've been pretty busy getting the lab in shape. Oh, we could be wrong, you know. Well, here's Marty's. Say, isn't that stretched snodgrass behind the soda fountain? Oh, yes, it is. Well, since when has Madison's star athlete become a soda jerk? Why not? He's a natural for the job. <laughs> Let's go in, hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, hello, Stretch. What's the good word? Boy. That's a pretty good word. <laughs> How come you're working here, Stretch? 
I thought you came down to school to straighten out the gym. Oh, I'd done that already. Stretch, I did that. Well, no wonder it looked so neat when I got there. <laughs> well, I'm just minding this place till Marty gets back. Where's Marty? Well, he's out to lunch. Oh, but I'll take your order, folks. He's out to lunch. What's wrong with the food he serves here? Please, not while I'm ordering. <laughs> oh, the food here's all right, but Marty likes to change once in a while. He's over at Chase and Nini's. It's an Italian restaurant. You know, a pizza rizzo rizzo. A pizza rizzo rizzo? Yes, ma'am. They fix veal a certain way he likes it. Scalapini? No, they only charge 40 cents a plate. <laughs> We got a veal cutlet blue plate here today that looks good. Comes with mashed potatoes and lima beans and includes dessert and coffee. Oh, how much does that cost, Stretch? Well, six bits. You think you'd like that, Miss Brooks? Sounds fine, Stretch. Okay. How about you, Mr. Boynton? You want some? How much is six bits? Oh, let's live dangerously, Mr. Boynton. Order it first and find out how much six bits is later. Oh, I'll tell you now. Six bits is just three two bitsers. <laughs> Three two-bitsers? Or one two-bitser and one four-bitser. <laughs> right, Stretch? That's right. It adds up to 75 cents. I see. Um, how much is the pork chop blue plate? Well, that's 65. He'll I'll take, take that. that. <laughs> I'll bring them both in two shakes of a lamb. Good. Uh, about Mr. Conklin, if he hasn't lost his job here, I'd feel kind of foolish. Oh, quiet. Quiet, Mr. Brooks. He just came in. Oh, hello there. Getting a bite of blood? <laughs> yes, sir. Why don't you join us, Mr. Conklin? Sit right down here. Oh, Stretch. Well, come on right up, folks. Uh, here's your lunch. Oh, hi, Mr. Conklin. I'm pinch hitting for Marty today. What can I get you? I'll have some cottage cheese. Just a small portion, please. About 15 cents worth. A glass of buttermilk. The five-cent glass. <laughs> Gosh, is that all you're going to eat? In my present condition, that is all I can afford to eat. <laughs> yes, sir. I'll get it for you right away, Mr. Conklin. Say, did you hear that, Miss Brooks? Yes, but it's hard to believe. After all, he's... Well, been... don't wait for me, folks. Dig right in and eat your meat and potatoes. <laughs> Vegetables. <laughs> well, they're nice and hot and delicious. <laughs> I knew it. He's hungry. Move over. He'll bite you in a minute. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Feeding your assorted faces? <laughs> yeah. Oh, hello, Mr. Conklin. Walter Denton. <laughs> oh, there's room at this table, Walter. Yeah, okay. I'll just help myself with some chow off the steam table. I'll be right over. Hey, Stretch, uh, what's underneath this gooey-looking black barbecue sauce? I don't know, Walter. I'll take it. <laughs> If Denton is coming to this table, I'll sit at the farthest possible end of it. Oh, uh, but Mr. Conklin... Please, please, I've little enough to eat. I might as well try to enjoy it. Well, here we are. Guess what's under this sauce? A bowl of noodle soup. No, ribs, spare ribs. Oh, boy, what a dish. Hey, mind if I join you folks? I'm going to eat my lunch now, too. Oh, not at all, Stretch. Sit right down here. Well, thanks. First, I'll bring Mr. Conklin his cheese and buttermilk. There. Thank you. No, I'll park me and my hot dogs and sauerkraut and baked beans right over here. No. <laughs> Mr. Boynton, we've got to do something about Mr. Conklin. He sounds like he's famished. Well, maybe we could share some of our lunch with him. Of course. Oh, uh, Mr. Conklin, I've got a tremendous veal cutlet here. Wouldn't you like a piece of it? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, how about a nice pork chop, Mr. Conklin? Can't touch them. Walter, ask Mr. Conklin to have some of your spare ribs. I'm sure he likes those. So do I. <laughs> I can't explain now, but your girlfriend's father's in a very bad way. He can't even afford a square meal. What? Oh, gosh, I didn't know it was that bad. Well, I couldn't stand by and let a dog starve. How about a nice spare rib, Prince? I, I mean, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> Mr. Conklin? Want some of my spare ribs, sir? No, thank you. Uh, we just believe in share and share alike, sir. Especially with our principal. You are our principal, aren't you? 
Well, I... Uh... Oh, Daddy, can you come over to your office right away? Mr. Stone is on the phone. I'll be right there, Harriet. Tell him to hold on one moment. Right, Daddy. Uh, this is the call I've been expecting. Au revoir, my friend. You mean you're leaving, Mr. Conklin? I'll see you all before I go, I'm sure. Remember, everything happens for the best. Then it's true. He's being fired. Even Harriet didn't know about this. We've got to do something. If he's so broke that he can't even order a decent lunch, how's he going to feed his family? Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we do what my mother done? Send laundry over to Mrs. Conklin. <laughs> hey, she's got a washing machine, and she could charge so much a bundle. Yeah, we'll call on all our neighbors. I'm sure they'll be glad to help. And we'll help Mrs. Conklin and Harriet do the laundry. That's us. All for one and one for all. In union, there is strength. Old friends are the best friends. Six Semper Sophie Suds. <laughs> Armis Brooks will return in a moment. Armis Brooks certainly does have her problems, but let's face it, we all do. They may not be as hilarious as hers, but we've got them. For instance, it's not possible for most of us to be at the scene of important happenings in world affairs. Maybe once or twice in a lifetime, Mr. and Mrs. Average Citizen will figure in a newsworthy experience. Beyond that, few of us participate in the world events that make the history books. This makes it impossible for the average man or woman to keep up with world affairs without help. The question of where to go for reliable help has been solved by CBS News. With eyewitness observers all around the globe, men who can fly without notice from their strategically central stations to wherever the news is happening, CBS News has complete coverage day and night throughout the week. You can come and go as you please, plan whatever plans you will, and always be sure that when you want to catch up with history, CBS News will catch you up on its earliest regularly scheduled news program. Solve your problem in keeping up with the news of the world by making CBS Radio your listening post. While due to a series of circumstances, everyone is convinced that Mr. Conklin is about to be fired and is practically destitute. So in true musketeer spirit, they have rallied to his aid by securing all the laundry business in the neighborhood and bringing it to his house. Oh, it's awfully nice of you to help out like this. But I can't help wondering what Mother will think when she gets back from her shopping trip. It'll be a nice surprise for her, Harriet. We've got enough business here to tide Mr. Conklin over for two weeks. Did you rig up the clothesline in the yard, Mr. Boynton? I did. I also put some up in the living room. We'll need every inch of space we can get. The stretch is still out getting more bundles. I had no idea Daddy was in such dire straits. Oh, but with friends like you, nobody could ever consider themselves poor. A friend in need is a friend indeed. Your problem is our problem. If I've said it once, I've said it twice. Six Semper Soapy Suds. <laughs> Yes, so you see, Osgood, the social duties that go with the position of assistant supervisor are most important. Yes, well, that's why I brought you to my home, Mr. Stone. I want you to see for yourself what a charming background for entertaining Mrs. Conklin has furnished. Under my supervision. <laughs> right, uh, right up these steps, if you please. Uh, let's see now, where's that key? Uh, you realize that you'll be called upon to receive city officials as well as many of our most influential PTA members from time to time. Oh, of course, of course. <laughs> ah, here we are. Here we are. After you. Oh, thank you. Now, if... Uh, what in the world is this? Sheets and towels hanging everywhere? Is this a laundry room? Laundry room? Where did, How could you... How you say it does look like laundry. It looks like everybody's laundry. Well, I, I can't understand this. Let's go into my den and I... Uh, Mr. Stone? Mr. Stone? Where are you, Mr. Stone? I'm over here in the underwear department. <laughs> now, see here, Conklin, just what is the meaning of this? I don't know anything about it, Mr. Stone, but I assure you, sir, that I... Oh, hi, Mr. Conklin. Business is great. Here's four more bundles. Snodgrass? Oh, but, no but, time to but, kibitz with you now. i got to get some more stuff down the block. Oh, before I go, I'd like to remind you about that bundle my mom sent over. Whatever you do, don't put no starch in my running pants. i got to bend my legs getting over those hurdles, you know. <laughs> Wait right here, Mr. Stone. I'll get to the bottom of this at once. What the devil's going on here? Oh, shucks. 
We wanted to surprise you, sir. Surprise me? Shut that contraption off, Boynton! Yes, sir. Now speak, somebody, and speak quickly. Well, we thought... Shut up! (laughs) Miss Brooks, what are you people doing here? Trying to help make both ends meet, Mr. Conklin. What both ends? Your both ends. (laughs) I mean, I mean, sir... When when we found out that you were fired, sir, we... Fired? I'm up for the most important job of my career. And the president of the Board of Education is standing in my living room right now, up to his neck in underwear. (laughs) Well, we only wanted to raise enough money so you could feed your family. Shut up! (laughs) Miss Brooks, while I'm composing myself, I want you to go into that living room and tell Mr. Stone you're completely to blame for this outrage. Me? But how can I... I don't care how, just do it. Because if I don't get this promotion, you'll never get me out of your hair. Now, Ma! Yes, sir. Mr. Stone? Yoo-hoo! Mr. Stone? Who's that? Oh, it's me, sir, Miss Brooks. Where are you? I can't seem to see you. Oh, you'd have a better view, sir, if you'd just drop that little flap in front of you. (laughs) Uh, I'll just walk around. Oh, You really must forgive the appearance of Mr. Conklin's living room, sir. Why must I? Because it's my fault. You see, my washing machine broke down, and Mrs. Conklin was kind enough to let me rinse out my personal things in here. (laughs) Do you expect me to believe that this laundry is all yours? That's what I hope you'll believe. But there are 24 bed sheets hanging here. I have twin beds. (laughs) I see. And how do you explain the fact, Miss Brooks, that there are men's pajamas hanging here. Pajamas? Well, uh, I bought them for my hope chest. <laughs> Sixteen pairs? <laughs> I got a lot of hope. <laughs> besides, I like to wear pajamas myself. But these are all different sizes. Well, sometimes I feel smaller than others. <laughs> right now, I could curl up in the cuffs. Look, Mr. Stone, there's no use my trying to deceive a clever man like yourself. I'd better tell the truth. It's about time. You see, we thought Mr. Conklin was about to be can't, about to lose his position as principal at Madison. So in order to help out until he got another job, we started this little laundry business in his home. And who is we, Miss Brooks? Another teacher and some of the students. You mean you felt such an intense loyalty for this man that you all rallied around in his time of need? He looked so hungry. Well, I trust Miss Brooks has cleared this matter up to your complete satisfaction, Mr. Stone. She certainly has, Osgood. As a matter of fact, she's been invaluable in helping me to arrive at a decision about our new assistant supervisor. You mean I'm in? No, Osgood, you're out. Any man who commands such respect and admiration from his colleagues is much too valuable, and he stays just where he is. But, Mr. Stone... No, that's my final word... Stay where you are, Principal Conklin. Good day. (laughs) Well, Miss Brooks. I'm going to wash that man right (laughs) off my head. Harvest Brooks, starring Eve Arden Transcribe, was produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Al Lewis with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Jane Morgan, Dick Crenna, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, Leonard Smith, Paula Winslow, and Joseph Kearns. Be sure to be with us next week for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks. Since school has been in session for two weeks now, our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, has practically forgotten about her summer vacation. I say practically because one reminder still reposes in her backyard. A small trailer which Miss Brooks and her landlady, Mrs. Davis, called home for a good part of the summer. Mrs. Davis called it home. I called it the aluminum (laughs) mousetrap. Anyway, now that the school season was on, Mrs. Davis was trying to sell it. 
She had put an ad in the paper early in the week, and by Friday morning at breakfast, I was naturally curious about the results. Any luck with Mousy, Mrs. Davis? Not much so far, Connie. I've only had two prospects all week long, a man and a woman. The woman came on Tuesday and only took one quick glance inside the trailer. What did she say? Nothing. She just gave a little scream and left. <laughs> what an accurate description. What about the man? Oh, he thought it was very nice. Then why didn't he take it? He said he already had one doghouse. <laughs> what did you say in your ad, Mrs. Davis? Well, you can see for yourself, Connie. It's still in today's paper on the next to the last page. Really? Well, let's have a look. It's under trailers for sale. Oh, thanks. I was looking under dog houses. <laughs> ah, here we are, trailers. Hmm. No, your ad isn't in today. Well, of course it is. It must be. There's only one ad for a trailer for sale on this page, and that says, Magnificent, super deluxe, spacious trailer. Ideal for family of four. Buy this trailer and live on the road in complete comfort. That's it, Connie. That's the ad. Do you think I exaggerated? <laughs> Everywhere except in the last sentence. If a family of four bought Mousy, the only place they could live in complete comfort is on the road. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, I'm surprised at you. A ten by seven foot trailer is hardly spacious. Your ad simply isn't fair, accurate, or honest. Well, I guess I just got carried away. But if anyone phones me today, I'll tell them the complete truth. Absolutely everything. Well, uh, you better not make it everything. There's no use mentioning the fact that if anyone opens the closet door, the ironing board comes down and knocks them cold. <laughs> no, we'd never sell it if I mentioned that. How about the scalp wounds you got from the ceiling every time you straightened up? Well, don't say anything about that either. Maybe we'll get a customer who's under four foot three. <laughs> Well, I certainly hope we can sell it, Connie. I could use my share of the $400 for repairs on this house. Why? Is something wrong? The pipes in the kitchen are in awful shape. The last few days, there's been more water on the floor than in the sink. <laughs> and it's leaked into the dining room. The plumber is supposed to start working on it today. But I think we'll have to eat out in the trailer tonight. Oh, that should be cozy. Well, I'd better get ready to go, Mrs. Davis. Walter Denton isn't calling for me this morning, and you know those buses. Yes, of course, dear. And, Connie, I hope you won't mind having dinner in the trailer too much. Not at all. I'll go to shop class first thing this morning and rehearse. Rehearse? Yes, I'll hit myself on the head with a hammer a few times. <laughs> Ah, the old wrist action still there, Harriet. Certainly feels great to have a fishing rod in my hand once more. Oh, I'm sure it does, Daddy, but I'd say a principal's office is hardly the place for a fishing rod if anyone were to ask me. Relax, no one's going to. <laughs> but what's it doing in here, Daddy? It's waiting to go on a little fishing trip with me. This may be my last opportunity this year, Harriet, and I've heard of a wonderful lake about a hundred miles from here. Real rugged territory. There are practically no cabins on it and no place open to tourists. Then where are you going to sleep? Well, I've got my own ideas about that. Uh, has Miss Brooks come in yet? Well, I don't think so. I haven't seen her this morning. You know, Daddy, I've never seen you treat her as nicely as you have so far this term. Well, she's never had a trailer before this term. <laughs> yeah. Well, why shouldn't I treat a deserving teacher nicely? I get it. The only reason you're so Harriet, nice... Harriet, you'll be late for class. Now run along. Yeah, but Daddy, I... Oh, there's Miss Brooks coming up the walk now. Where? Well, oh, yes, yes, there's my pigeon. Uh, Miss Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, Harriet, I'd like to have a few words with her before classes begin. Can't I even wait to say good morning to her? You cannot. By the time you two get through saying good morning, it's time for lunch. To my inner office, please, Harriet. Yeah, but Daddy... Exit I... smiling, girls. <laughs> oh, all right. Ah, uh, yes, the old wrist action is still there. Uh, I walk slowly to the door. 
I should arrive there just in time to say... Good morning, Miss Brooks. <laughs> oh, good morning, Mr. Conklin. Catching much? <laughs> That's rich. <laughs> if you'll step into my office, there's something I'd like to discuss with you. Yes, sir. Now, please, sit down. No, 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 no. Not over there. Over here in the comfortable chair. Huh? Oh, I forgot. This is a brand new type term. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I'll come directly to the point. The reason I have this fishing rod in my hand is because I intend to go fishing this weekend. Sounds logical. Uh, however, the lake in which I want to fish is quite a distance from here. A magnificent place, miles away from civilization. It's called Oo Mimi Tokaluti Gucci Mumu Lake. <laughs> Oo Mimi, I doubt if I can make it. It's quite simple. Oo Mimi Tokaluti Gucci Mumu. It's an Indian name. What does it mean? Blue. <laughs> I'd hate to hear their name for purple. They say that the fishing at Oo Mimi Tukaluti Gucci Mumu is the finest in the country. Very few people have found out about it so far. Very few people could ask directions. <laughs> yes, yes. However, there are absolutely no tourist accommodations in the neighborhood, and that is where I thought you could help, Miss Brooks. Me? Yes, knowing you as I do, I felt confident that you would be more than happy to lend me your trailer for the weekend. Oh, but it's Mrs. Davis's trailer, too, Mr. Conklin. And although I know she would cooperate, we just couldn't let you have it this weekend. I don't like to disappoint you, sir, so I won't. How would you like to have the trailer at your disposal every weekend from now on? Every weekend? Miss Brooks, are you serious? I have never been more so. All you have to do is buy it. <coughs> Buy it? <laughs> Buy the trailer? Did I say a naughty word? <laughs> it's only $400. Miss Brooks, I haven't the slightest need for a trailer except on rare occasions. Since this weekend is one of them, I should like to borrow the vehicle. Well, sir, in that case, I can't possibly Don't let you... Don't give me your decision at once, Miss Brooks. Think it over for a while. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Conklin, Bearing but... in mind, of course, how pleasant your life here at Madison has been so far this term, <laughs> and that as my subordinate, it is within my power to continue to help make it the pleasant thing it's been, or on the other hand... What time would you like to pick it up? <laughs> I'll be over about seven o'clock. Now, I believe you have a class to make, Miss Brooks, so I won't keep you another minute. Yes, sir. Goodbye, Mr. Conklin. We'll see you at seven, Miss Brooks. See you at seven, Miss Brooks. What a dictator. But if he spends a weekend in our trailer, I'll be even with him. <laughs> oh, Miss Brooks. Oh, there you are. I've been looking all over for you. Good morning, Mr. Boynton. Oh, here, let me carry your books for you, Miss Brooks. Why, well, thank you. You know, you've been very considerate to me lately. Well, I think friends should do things for one another, Miss Brooks. Don't you feel that way? Absolutely. Here, let me carry your books for you. Uh, <laughs> that, that isn't quite what I had in mind. But there is a favor I have to ask of you. And because of the urgency of my problem, I'm going to need an answer immediately. Immediately? I hope you don't mind my pressing you. Bribery will get you nowhere. <laughs> well, what's the favor? Well, my apartment house was sold last week, and the new owner needs my apartment for his family. So far, I haven't been able to find a place I can afford, and I have to move by tonight. Oh, that's terrible. I'd be satisfied with any sort of a small place to stay in for the weekend until I can find another apartment. Uh, I was wondering if you have any suggestions. You bet I have. I know a place you can live in rent-free. You do? Sure. Why don't you buy our trailer? Buy your trailer? Buy it? I'd better watch my language. <laughs> it's, it's only $400, Mr. Boynton. $400? How could I possibly get $400 in one lump? Roll it together. <laughs> but it, maybe it wouldn't have to be in one lump. Mrs. Davis and I would consider time payments. No, no thanks. I'm not in the market for a trailer, Miss Brooks. 
But if you could only let me stay in it for the weekend, I'd be indebted to you for life. Well, I'd like to help you, but... Oh, you, you can't let me down, Miss Brooks. You, you've just got to let me sleep in your backyard tonight. Well, maybe I can work it out, Mr. Boynton, but there's one thing I think you should know. Oh, what's that? You might go to sleep in my backyard, but there's a very good chance that you'll wake up in Ooh, Mimi, Tokaluti, Gucci, Moo Moo Lake. <laughs> Well, having promised our trailer to both Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton for the weekend, I had to think of some way of breaking my promise to Mr. Conklin. I was too busy to think about it all morning, but at lunchtime, while I was sitting alone in the cafeteria pondering the problem, my reverie was interrupted by the dulcet tones of Walter Denton. Salutations, most revered educator. <laughs> Well, first, I want to apologize because I couldn't drive you to school this morning. Oh, that's all right. No, I really felt terrible about it, Miss Brooks, because it's always such a great pleasure to serve you, such a truly great pleasure. Well, thank you, Walter. Isn't there something I can do for you now? Anything at all? You just name it, and I'll do it. Anything, anything you want. Hmm, huh? Anything? Hmm? Down, boy, down. <laughs> just what favor are you after, Walter? Yeah. Favor? From you? Miss Brooks, I'm chagrined. Well, how can you possibly look for hidden motives in one who is not only your greatest admirer and supporter, but one who... No, you can't borrow my trailer for the weekend. <laughs> you know, fine friend you are. I wanted to use it as a dark room. But how'd you know that's what I was going to ask you? Because two of my other greatest admirers and supporters, namely Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton, have already borrowed it for this weekend. Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton, are they going someplace together? It's beginning to look that way. <laughs> Hi, Miss Brooks. Hello, Walter. Hello, Harriet. I'm glad I found you, Miss Brooks. There's something I've been wanting to ask you. The answer is no, but you can buy it if you want to. <laughs> what are you talking about, Miss Brooks? I was just going to ask you to call Mrs. Davis. She just phoned and said it's urgent that she speak with you. Well, where was I when the call came in? On your way up here, I guess. Why don't you do it right now? You can use the pay phone on the wall. Got a dime? You, here, I got a dime. Here, yeah, take this dime, please. Go ahead. I, you, oh, I forgot. I can't have the trailer. <laughs> I have a dime. I owe the bus driver, but I have a dime. <laughs> If you'll excuse me, I'll use it right away. I wonder what could be so urgent. Oh, well, I'll know in a minute. You and the night and the music fill me with flaming desire. How nice of you to say so. <laughs> Is that you, Henry? No, Mrs. Davis, it's Connie. Connie Brooks. But who's Henry? The butcher. He said he'd call for my order this morning. Well, if that's the way he feels about you, why have our chops been so tough lately? <laughs> Never mind, Mrs. Davis. What is it you wanted to talk to me about? Talk to you about? Yes, when you called me. Now, isn't that funny? I could have sworn that you called me. Well, whoever called who lets make our conversation brief. Our party line gets pretty busy this time of day, and I don't want to keep the phone occupied too long. Well, you're certainly considerate, Mrs. Davis. Oh, it isn't that, Connie. It's just that I find their conversation so much more interesting than mine. <laughs> well, I'll try to be as entertaining as possible. Look, Mrs. Davis, you gave Harriet Conklin the message to have me call you at once. Now, concentrate. What was it about? Your health? The house? The plumber? The trailer? That's it, Connie. The trailer. You haven't sold it, have you? Not yet, dear, but practically. The man who phoned seemed very interested. He didn't balk at the price, but he wanted to see it before he bought it. I knew there was a joker in the deal. Uh, when's he coming over? At about seven tonight. At seven? Yes. I asked him to join us for dinner in the trailer. Of course, I told him it was quite spacious, so I thought it would give him a greater illusion of roominess if only one of us had dinner with him. Or can you think of a better idea? Not unless he goes in by himself and we toss his food to him through the window. <laughs> Mrs. Davis, I'd better get busy. Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton were scheduled to be over here at 7, too. Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton? You mean they thought they might buy our trailer? Watch that word, Mrs. Davis. There are ladies present. 
Yeah. I'll see you later, but right now I'd better say goodbye. All right, dear. Go ahead. Goodbye, Mrs. Davis. Goodbye, Henry. <laughs> now, that ought to confuse the party line. Well, what did Mrs. Davis want, Miss Brooks? She's got a customer for our trailer, Walter. The only trouble is he's due to arrive the same time as Mr. Conklin and Mr. Boynton, and you know the size of that trailer. Oh, I certainly do. But I have biology class with Mr. Boynton this afternoon, so if you want, I'll tell him not to show up this evening. Oh, I'd appreciate that, Walter. And when I see Daddy, I'll tell him not to come either, Miss Brooks. Thanks, Harriet. That'll take a big load off my mind. No disrespect intended. <laughs> now, there's just one more thing I should do to ensure the sale of our trailer. What's that, Miss Brooks? Get the customer not to show up. <laughs> well, since Mrs. Davis had invited a prospective buyer to have dinner with us in the aluminum cigar box that passes as a trailer, Mr. Boynton and Mr. Conklin had to make other plans for the weekend. Later that evening, as Mrs. Davis was cooking dinner in our trailer... I sat perfectly still so as not to crowd her. Mrs. Davis, you've been over that stove long enough. Now it's my turn to stand up. No, you stay on the dinette seat a little while longer, Connie. There's just not enough room for the two of us to move around. But I insist, Mrs. Davis, it's my turn to stand up. Well, that's the way you feel about it. Come ahead. Thanks. <laughs> like I say, it's my turn to sit down. Dear, did you hurt your head badly? No worse than usual. Between the ceiling and this closet with a sneaky ironing board, I'm getting used to it. Oh, I fixed that closet, Connie. Try it now. All right. <coughs> I must have fixed something else. You'll find some gauze in the medicine cabinet I just put up. Where? Oh, here. <laughs> It's a very handy place for it. I'll get it. I'm standing right by the door, as who isn't. Mr. Boynton, what are you doing here? Didn't Walter Denton ask you not to show up this evening? Well, no. I never got back to school this afternoon. I had so much packing to do, Mr. Conklin gave me the time off. I guess he took my classes himself. Well, now that you're here, you might as well come in while I tell you why you have to leave right away. Well, thanks. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. Hello, Mr. Boynton. It's a shame you have to be running along so soon. You see, Mr. Boynton, we've got a prospective buyer for the trailer, and he's due here in about five minutes. I rushed right back to help Mrs. Davis get the trailer in shape. Oh, I see. The ad said this was quite a spacious trailer, so we wanted to show it to him under the best possible circumstances, which is empty, or as empty as possible. It is quite tiny, isn't it? We're in pretty close quarters right now. Yes, it has got its advantages. <laughs> well, I'd better be going. I'm afraid I'm making you and Mrs. Davis uncomfortable. Oh, you can stay a little while longer, Mr. Boynton. We're not a bit uncomfortable, are we, Mrs. Davis? <laughs> Mrs. Davis, where are you? Under the dinette table, dear. <laughs> I'm afraid it might be a little crowded with the three of us standing. Oh, don't be silly, Mrs. Davis. Please get up. There, it isn't too crowded at all. Well, we're almost cheek to cheek, Miss Brooks. I know. <laughs> One more person in here and we'd be over the top. <laughs> You're not really uncomfortable, are you, Mr. Boynton? Uncomfortable? Well, uh, I must confess I'm a bit warm. Why, Mr. Boynton. <laughs> Maybe he's sitting on the stove. <laughs> Don't be a killjoy. I'd better be going, Miss Brooks. Your customer should be here any minute. Or even sooner. Mr. Conklin, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? I'm going fishing. That's what I'm doing here. Oh, hello, Margaret. And Boynton, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? He was just leaving. That's what he's doing here. But, Mr. Conklin, didn't Harriet give you my message asking you to cancel your visit? I got no message of any kind. Right after school, I locked myself in my workroom and spent the afternoon tying flies. Well, if you can't beat them, tie them. I don't know. <laughs> well, you see, Osgood, we're expecting a prospective buyer. I don't care who you're expecting. I've made arrangements to go fishing, and I'm staying in this trail over the weekend. 
Now, where can I put this fishing gear? Well, there's a closet at your elbow, sir. Oh, uh, no, Mr. Conklin. You'd better not try it. I to... said I was staying, Miss Brooks. I'll just open this closet. No! Like he's saying, all right. I only wish that... I'll get it. Why, Harriet. Hi, Miss Brooks. Might as well come aboard, Harriet. All right, everybody. Inhale. <laughs> Miss Brooks, I just came over to tell you that I missed Daddy today at school, so I couldn't give him your message. By the time I got home, he wasn't there either. Now I don't know where he is. You're standing on him. <laughs> Oh, 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 please take your foot away. Why, Daddy, what are you doing down there? I was viciously attacked from behind. <laughs> By a sneaky ironing board. But I'm glad you're with us again, sir. Here, let me help you up. Yeah. Well, are we all nicely wedged in again? Miss Brooks, I insist that you get everyone out of here so I can be on my way. Oh, we'll discuss it in a moment, sir. Just as soon as I see who this is. Hello, Miss Brooks. I came over to tell you I missed Mr. Boynton today. I just couldn't seem to find him anywhere. Step back, Walter. Your breath is taking the starch out of his collar. <laughs> Come on in. I'm trying to. Here, let me help you, Walter. Yeah. Come yeah. on, everybody. Give a little. <clears throat> what was that? My suspenders just went. <laughs> Mr. Conklin, I said, give a little, not all. <laughs> well, don't worry, sir. With this crowd, your trousers will never make it to the floor. <laughs> Are you in yet, Walter? Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm in. I'm out. Harriet, pull Mr. Boynton back in. That a girl. Now, is everyone all right? I think we'd better call the roll just to make sure. Uh, Mr. Conklin, where are you? Wedged in tight between my daughter and Mrs. Davis. Walter? I'm wedged in next to Harriet, too, Miss Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shut up! Uh, Mrs. Davis? I'm stuck next to Mr. Boynton. Stuck, she says. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Boynton? Now, how did you get your neck caught under my arm? <laughs> oh, well. This must be our customer. Now, let's not get panicky. Good evening. Uh, good evening, sir. Are you the man Mrs. Davis spoke to on the phone? Yes, I am. Well, won't you come in? <laughs> You're kidding, of course. I guess it does appear a bit crowded to you. A yeah, wee bit, yes, it's... Sort of like opening a can of sardines and finding five or six live ones inside. Uh, yes. Well, I suppose you'd like to speak to Mrs. Davis. I would indeed. I'm Mrs. Davis. Where? Right here. <laughs> right here on Mr. Boynton's arm. Bend over, Mr. Boynton, and let me have a look at him. Uh, certainly, Mrs. Davis. Oh, there you are, Mrs. Davis. No, you're looking at Walter Denton. <laughs> Mrs. Davis is under his other arm. Oh. Oh, of course. Uh, let me show you some of the trailer's features, sir. Uh, for instance, right over there are the stove and icebox. Where? Harriet Conklin is in front of them. Then her father, Mr. Conklin, is in front of the bed. And Mr. Boynton is in front of the bathroom. Neat, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yes, indeed. Everybody in here looks very livable. <laughs> uh, but I don't know why you're telling me all this. Why we're telling you? Well, you're interested, aren't you? I'm fascinated. Things like this don't happen to a plumber every day. <laughs> plumber? Well, yes, ma'am. I came here to report on the kitchen pipes. Did you take a look at them? Every one of them. All over the yard. All over the yard? What is all this anyway? Well, he's a red one, isn't he? <laughs> well, you see, Mrs. Davis, the pressure in one of the pipes behind your stove became the wall right off your service porch. Why, that's terrible. Oh, it certainly is. And it's been happening to me with alarming frequency lately. Almost every time I work around a stove, a wall blows out. Well, there's nothing more I can do tonight. Oh, yes, there is. How would you like to make $10 right now? $10? How? Do a little work on the stove in this trailer. <laughs> Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon.
At Madison High School, where she teaches English, the popularity of Armis Brooks is second to none. But when you get right down to it, she can count her close friends on the fingers of one hand. Or if you want to get down even lower, on the toes of one foot. <laughs> of course, my dearest friend is my landlady, Mrs. Davis. And most of the time, I have no hesitancy in discussing my problems with her. Particularly when she gives me the opening, as she did last Friday morning at breakfast. Here, dear, have a little more tea. Honey, I hate to bring this up, but, well, you don't look rested at all. It's merely because I haven't been getting any sleep. For the past three nights, I've been having bad dreams, Mrs. Davis. Bad dreams? You've got to tell me about them, Connie. You must. Well, my dream is a recurrent one. Every night, I dream that someone's chasing me with a knife. Connie! <laughs> Perhaps it's something in your subconscious, something in your past that'll explain your psychopathic fear of knives. Well, what's psychopathic about it? Look, Mrs. Davis, just because you're superstitious about... I'm not at all superstitious. I'm a completely practical woman who believes in being prepared for the future. Now, where did I leave my fortune-telling cards? <laughs> In the silverware drawer on top of your Ouija board. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, here they are. I'll mix them up just a bit. Huh. First card, Jack of Diamonds. That's good. He's the symbol of goodwill and friendship. Now then, the next card is the Queen of Spades. <laughs> Connie, the Queen of Spades is a symbol of ill will and enmity. Enmity is overpowering friendship. The cards have spoken. They say that by nightfall, Connie Brooks, you will have lost all your friends. Oh, of all the ridiculous conclusions. <laughs> now, really, Mrs. Davis, there's no reason. I'll be right with you. That's Walter Denton to drive me to school. Now, try to pull yourself together, Mrs. Davis. Now, just forget the cards. No one in his right mind would believe in cards. Now, just a minute. I'm not in my right mind. Isn't that what you mean? I didn't say that. I said... Oh, yes, you did. I did not. Now, go ahead. Go ahead. Bully me. <laughs> Tell me I'm mentally unbalanced. <laughs> oh, believe me, dear. I wouldn't do anything in the world to hurt That's you. That's the last insult I'll ever take from you. I'm going to my room. Mrs. Davis! I'm one friend you can cross off your list. Goodbye, Miss Brooks. Friendship, friendship, such a perfect friendship. When other friendships have been forgotten, ours will still be hot. Glorious, glorious autumn. Awake ye songbirds and serenade the sallow sun. Oh, there's a real bite in the air, Miss Brooks. Well, close the window. I've already been bitten. <laughs> Gosh, you're certainly in a shoveling mood this morning. Shoveling? You know, grave diggerish. <laughs> it's an expression used by the younger malt shop set. It's synonymous with party pooperish. <laughs> party pooperish? Yeah, like the noun schnuckle. Come on, pull out of the pea soup, Miss Brooks. Don't be an oddball. No wonder you flunked your last English test. <laughs> That's enough malt shop jive for today, thanks. I've had it. Walter, you know how close Mrs. Davis and I have always been. Do you think anything could happen between us that could result in our becoming, well, enemies? Oh, oh of course not. Oh, little differences might arise occasionally, but those could be of no more than fleeting duration. You're right. When I get home from school, she'll be the same friendly, lovable Mrs. Davis that she's always been, of course. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's good to see you smile, Miss Brooks. For a minute there, you looked as if you'd been stabbed with a knife. <laughs> Holy cow, what did I do now? That word knife, I guess I'm allergic to it, Walter. I've been having a recurrent dream lately in which someone is chasing me with a knife. Someone? A man or a woman? I never stopped to ask it. <laughs> Maybe it's Mr. Boynton. He showed you his new stout knife last week, you remember? 
Maybe that's sticking in your subconscious. No, he put it back in his pocket. <laughs> oh, I suppose I could be wrong, but you... Oh, here's the school, Miss Brooks. I'll pull up and let you off in the front. Well, thanks for the lift, Walter. You're a true friend. Day after day, month after month, picking me up to drive me to school. Oh, you know, just a minute, Miss Brooks. I, I thought we might discuss this matter at lunch, but since you've brought it up, I may as well break it to you now. Uh, this is the last time I'll be able to drive you to school. The last time? I don't understand. Well, I'm a growing boy, Miss Brooks, and I need my sleep. So I figured out that if I don't have to pick you up in the morning, I can grab off an extra ten minutes to shut eye. So, at last you've revealed yourself in your true colors. Huh? If you think more of a little sleep than you do of me, then you're no friend of mine. Goodbye, Mr. Denton. Mr. Denton? Friendship, friendship. Just a perfect friendship. Well, superstition or not, Mrs. Davis's prediction that I would be friendless before nightfall was turning out to be awesomely accurate. The score was two down, Mrs. Davis and Walter Denton, and one to go, the one being Mr. Boynton. However, shortly before noon, I was summoned to my principal's office. Good morning, Mr. Never Conner. mind that. I summoned you here to discuss the chair you rammed against the wall yesterday. I hold you personally responsible for the damage. Twenty dollars, please, hand it over. Twenty? <laughs> Twenty dollars? Mr. Conklin, I'm going to be perfectly frank with you. I'm going to open my bag, empty it on your desk, and show you all the money I have in the world. Empty your bag on my desk? I... about the contents of women's bags before, Miss Brooks. But aren't you overdoing it just to try? Well, as you can see, sir, besides the bric-a-brac, my bag contains only $15, and I need every penny of it for the down payment on the gown I'm to wear at the biologist's ball. Five, ten, fifteen dollars. Thank you very much, and good day. Huh? You can owe me the other five. Now shovel this female folly back into your bag and run along, Miss Brooks. Just a minute, sir. You've got to give that money back to me. If I don't get that gown, I won't be able to go to the ball. Mr. Boynton's going as Romeo, and I'm going as Juliet. Well, get off your balcony, Julie. You've been grounded. <laughs> now, this discussion is closed. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Quite clear, sir. I am sorry about the ball, Miss Brooks. Too bad. You'd have made a wonderful Juliet. Ah, uh, Juliet. The loveliest flower in all Verona, fair Juliet, who found love sublime only to die by her own hand, stabbed with a knife. Ah! Friendship, friendship, just a perfect friendship. Another friendship of Ah, shut up. Uh... Well, I'm sorry to be late for lunch, Miss Brooks. Oh, you got meatballs, hmm? Just one meatball. I couldn't list its mate. That's a job for Tarzan. I got one meatball myself. Imagine, they charge 40 cents for meatballs in this place now. 40 cents is small change, Mr. Boynton. I know a girl who has a bigger financial problem. Now, what's your girlfriend's problem? Well, she can't afford to buy a new gown she was planning to wear on a date tomorrow night. A rather heavy date. Well, does she have another gown? Yes and no. That is, she has a gown, but it's rather old. Oh, I don't care how old it is. Remember that old blue taffeta thing you wore last New Year's? <laughs> Did I say anything? <laughs> Not a word. My old blue taffeta. I have it, Mr. Boynton. I know just what to do with it. What? I'll crimp the bodice, Juliet style, and wear it to the biologist ball. <laughs> just for kicks. Would you mind? Why should I mind? What you wear is entirely up to you. I hope you have a lot of fun at the ball, Miss Brooks. Oh, I'm sure I will, Mr. Barton. Oh, by the way, who are you going with? With whom am I going? Whom? 
direct objects of verbs, indirect objects, and objects of prepositions are in the objective case, Mr. Martin. Therefore, the preposition with must take the relative pronoun whom in those sentences in which the objective, who am I going with? <laughs> Yes. As I stated in the note I sent to your classroom an hour ago... I, I wasn't I, in my classroom an hour ago. I took my class to the library. What note? I didn't get any note. Well, then I'll explain. As you know, Miss Brooks, the tickets for last year's ball were priced at one dollar. When I called this morning to reserve our tickets, however, I was chagrined to learn that this year they have, without justifiable cause, upped the price to two dollars and fifty cents. Well, I certainly wouldn't want to shell out two fifty for a ticket, Miss Brooks. So I decided that I'm not going to the ball. Oh, you dropped your silverware, Miss Brooks. Here, I'll, uh, I'll pick it up for you. Mr. Boynton, we had a definite date. I think you're being very unfair. Unfair? If you had my interests at heart. I did have your interest at heart. I didn't want you to pay two fifty for your ticket either. <laughs> At last, you've shown yourself in your true colors. What are you talking about? I was just... Oh, here. <laughs> what was that for? I simply offered you the knife you dropped. You tried to stab me with it. Stab you? First, you tried to stab me in my dreams, and now you break a date while I'm wide awake. You and I are through, Mr. Boynton, washed up. Are you kidding? That's the last insult I'll ever take from you. I'm going back to my classroom. Well, just a minute, Miss Brooks. Goodbye, party pooper. Well, after I lost my last friend, I finally came to a definite decision. Shortly after making it, I ran into Harriet Conklin in the hall. Going home for the day, Miss Brooks? Not for the day. I'm going for keeps, Harriet. For keeps? I'm tired of this school and certain people in it. Oh, not you, Harriet. You've been very sweet. I'm going to miss you. But, Miss Brooks... Think of me once in a while. Bye now. Miss Brooks... Stay away from us! I have nothing to discuss with you, Walter. When certain people do things to hurt me, I want no part of them. If you'll excuse me now. Move along, then. Move along. No loitering in the halls. You know my rules concerning loitering. How would loitering. you like to go take a flying leap at the moon? <laughs> What's that? You heard me. I don't have to kowtow to you anymore, Mr. Conklin. You'll find my resignation on your desk. Resignation? Well, Miss Brooks, come back. Miss Brooks! Gone like a shot. Yeah. Good English teachers aren't easy to dig up. I wish I could think of something to change her mind. Well, she intimated that certain people did things to hurt her. Maybe one of us is the certain people she meant. You're right. And you're the one she was looking at when she said it. <laughs> what did you do to Miss Brooks, Danton? Well, don't blame me. You're the one she was looking at. Come clean, Mr. Conklin. <laughs> She wasn't looking at me. She was, too. She was looking at Boynton. <laughs> what have you got to say for yourself, Boynton? How'd you like to go take a flying leap at the moon? <laughs> friendship, friendship. That's perfect friendship. Another friendship a man forgot. Mine'll still be hot. <laughs> You've hardly touched your dinner, Connie. Whether or not I eat should be of no concern of yours, Mrs. Davis. You told me to cross you off my list of friends, remember? Oh, that was this morning. Now that you've lost your other friends, I wouldn't dream of deserting you. Welcome home. But please don't mention that word dream. It's incredible the way things worked out, Mrs. Davis. The knife bit in my dreams and then losing my friends as you predicted. I'm sure that part was coincidence, and yet I won't rest until I find out what's causing those dreams. Someone's at the door. I'm going to my room. Whoever it is, I'm not in, Mrs. Davis. I don't want to see anyone. All right, dear. Why, Mr. Boynton. Uh, good evening, Mrs. Davis. I, uh, I'd like to see Miss Brooks, if she'll let me. She'd love to see you. <laughs> 
You just make yourself comfortable, Mr. Boynton. Now go fetch her. Honey, Mr. Boynton's in the living room, and he'd like to see you if you'll let him. I'd love to see him. What's the matter with you? You're smiling. Oh, it's wonderful, Mrs. Davis. I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but I've just eliminated one of the major barriers on my road to happiness. What? I'll explain later. Now, if I can just make up with Mr. Boynton. That won't be difficult. He's the picture of remorse. Oh. Well, then I'll let him make up with me. <laughs> Off goes the smile, Mrs. Davis. Oh, hello there, Miss Brooks. Oh, Mr. Boynton. What do you hear from the guinea pigs, Doc? Uh, <laughs> uh, Miss Brooks, I, I have been thinking that there's something I'd like to say to you. There is absolutely nothing you can say, Mr. Boynton, that could possibly be of any interest to me. Miss Brooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> two fifty or no two fifty. I just purchased two tickets for the biologist ball tomorrow night. I was wondering if you'd wear that beautiful old blue taffeta thing of yours and be my dad. Come in. Good evening. Oh, Mr. Boynton. How are you? I don't know yet, Walter. Yeah, Miss Brooks, I've been thinking. If you have, you must have stolen the mechanical brain somewhere. <laughs> oh, don't be cruel, Miss Brooks. I realize I don't really lose any shut-eye when I pick you up and drive you to school every morning, so I'd like to continue doing so, if you don't mind, please. What do you say, Miss Brooks? Huh, please? Well... One left the door open, didn't one? <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Conklin. At ease, at ease. <laughs> ah, Miss Brooks, dear Miss Brooks. <laughs> you know what I did, you naughty little girl. <laughs> well, I tore up your letter of resignation. Yes, I did, I did, I did, did, did. <laughs> Moreover, I called the Board of Education and appropriated ample money to repair the damage to the wall in your classroom. <laughs> Therefore, I should like to return the $15 I playfully took from you this morning. <laughs> uh, you will accept the money and let bygones be bygones, Miss Brooks? I believe I can answer all three of you boys in one crisp sentence. Mr. Boynton, you may take me to the ball... You may continue picking me up for school, Walter. And Mr. Conklin, hand over the 15 fish. <laughs> A dollar. I heard everything, Connie. Now you can buy the new gown for the ball. Of course, you don't have to wait until then to date her, Mr. Boynton. While I'm fixing a snack for Walter and Mr. Conklin, why not take her out to a movie? Well, that's a splendid idea. Yes, isn't it? Uh, they can wait for a minute for the snack, Mrs. Davis. Come and help me get my things. Excuse us, folks. I'll get your coat, dear. Meanwhile, you can explain what you meant when you said you discovered what's been blocking your path to happiness. I was referring to those dreams in which someone's been chasing me with a knife. Those nightmares are gone, Mrs. Davis, gone for good. Then it was something in your subconscious, wasn't it? Oh, definitely. You see where the covers are off my bed? Yes. Well, take a good look at that bed spring sticking through my mattress. <laughs> That's what was stabbing my subconscious. <laughs> Our Miss Brooks, sorry, you've hardened transcribed. It's produced and directed by Larry Burns, written by Joe Swillen and Al Lewis with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Conklin was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Dick Crenna, Jane Morgan, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, and Judd Conlon's Were the Mayors. Marvis Brooks, starring Eve Arden. Schools make the woman as well as the man. And Armis Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High, is regarded as the school's best-dressed teacher. And that includes many of the male teachers. But my rep as the campus clothes horse must be attributed to the dressmaking talents of my landlady, Mrs. Davis, who frequently surprises me by making stunning creations which I purchased for the cost of the material. When I joined her at breakfast last Thursday, in fact, 
she had whipped up another surprise for me. Look, dear, I made this dress for you. That dress for me? If you like it, I'll take it off. Not while I'm eating, please. I like to dress very much, Mrs. Davis, but I'm afraid I can't afford it. I'll have to find something cheaper. But you'll just have to pay for the material, Connie. That was only a dollar and thirty-five. That's what I mean. I'll have to find something cheaper. <laughs> oh, there you go, teasing me. You told me yesterday that you found a hundred-dollar bill in your dresser. That's right. It was a bill from Sherry's department store. I didn't pay them for my bedroom furniture last month. My goodness. I thought you found a hundred dollars in cash. That's what I told Harriet Conklin when I saw her at the movies last night. What? Oh, great. Now it'll be all over the school. Harriet's a lovely girl, Mrs. Davis, but she is a gossip. Now, now, don't get excited. I told her it was confidential, so I'm sure she'll keep it a secret. A secret? That's a laugh. A secret in Harriet's hands is as confidential as Ali Khan's romances. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better tell her the truth when you see her at school. And have her go blabbing it around that I owe Sherry's a hundred dollars? No, thanks. But actually, all I have in the world is the 45 cents that's in my purse. And I'll probably blow my 45 cents at lunch. Now what'll I do for dinner? Have you thought of Mr. Boynton? Frequently, but what'll I do for dinner? <laughs> I mean, don't you think Mr. Boynton would be interested in taking you to dinner? He's as broke as I am. Faculty payday was pushed back from yesterday to next Monday. Consequently, many of our teachers are feeling the pinch. Not that big, handsome French teacher who has a crush on you, I bet. Mr. LeBlanc? He often addresses me in French at school, Mrs. Davis. Then he smiles at me as if I understood. Then I smile at him as if he's right. I should tell him I don't understand a word he's saying. No, you shouldn't. That's your angle, Connie. He doesn't think you do understand until you can wangle a dinner invitation out of him. Are you out of your mind, Mrs. Davis? That would be utterly deceitful. All right, dear. But you have only 45 cents, and you're going to be awfully hungry around dinner time. I think I'll let him order me a cup of onion soup. I don't swim very well. <laughs> A hundred dollar bill, Harriet. Miss Brooks found a hundred dollars. That's right, Mr. LeBlanc. Oh, oh, but please don't tell Miss Brooks I told you. I will not breathe it to a soul. You are aware that the faculty checks are late, Harriet, and uh, as you undergraduates would put it, I am fractured. Uh, how I am to eat dinner tonight, I do not know. Were I back in my native village in France, uh, this would not be a problem, for they are now celebrating the day of C'est à la femme de Debussy. What in the world is that? Well, it is somewhat comparable to your Sadie Hawkins Day in this country, a day on which the woman goes after the man, uh, not for marriage, of course, just for a date. She then becomes his host for the night. I don't get it. Well, I will explain. C'est à la femme de Debussy means... It is the woman's turn to pay. After dinner, for example, it is not the man, but the woman who pays the check. I think that's cute. I like it. <laughs> Back home, you see, I would simply get myself a date, and she would pay for my dinner. Ah, oh, but where am I to find such a woman in this country? Oh, good morning, Mr. LeBlanc. A uh, bonjour, I mean. Bonjour. Bonjour, Miss Brooks. Uh... Ah, yes, uh, Miss Brooks and I knew the million for soul. I beg your pardon? Uh, that is French, uh, meaning uh, we would like to be alone. Oh, don't mind me. I'll just... You heard him. Nous aimerions être seul. <laughs> and pronto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Miss Brooks. Bye now. Miss Brooks, I am honored that you should drop into my classroom. What can I do for you, my dear? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. <laughs> How marvelous you look. Simply magnificent. You look good enough to eat. What time? <laughs> uh, 
forgive me, an association of ideas, Mr. LeBlanc. <laughs> Silly, but when you mentioned the word eat, I suddenly realized that I don't have a dinner date for this evening. You do not? What a coincidence. Pardon? I, I do not myself either have a dinner date, too. I do not myself neither also. <laughs> Miss Brooks, this is too good to be true. By now, I thought surely you would have been invited to Boynton. Oh, I believe he has a prior commitment with a lonesome frog. Anyway, I wouldn't be interested in dining with Mr. Boynton. Just between us, he bores me. Mr. Boynton? But why? Well, he just doesn't have the continental qualities that I like in a man. During dinner, he always talks to me in English. English? Kill me, but when I'm eating, there's nothing like kicking around a little French talk. <laughs> what a coincidence. Ah, je ne trouve rien de plus stimulant pendant le dîner que d'avoir une conversation amicale dans ma propre langue. You're playing our song. <laughs> uh, you know, Miss Brooks, I enjoy your company very much. Nothing could make me happier than to have dinner with you tonight. But I, I hesitate to suggest this. Oh, go on. Take a crack at it. <laughs> well, uh, the reason for my reluctance is that in the little French village from which I come, uh, they are celebrating the day of C'est à la femme de Débossé. You're kidding. Well, what do you know? I forgot to look at my French calendar this morning. <laughs> the one with Marilyn de Gaulle on it. <laughs> <laughs> what a coincidence. You know, of all the French holidays, C'est à la femme de Dubourset happens to be my favorite. You know about it, Miss Brooks? You know, then, that uh, C'est à la femme de Dubourset means... Please, that... you don't have to explain French to me, Mr. LeBlanc. How do you think I am? A square? <laughs> A thousand pardons, mademoiselle. Oh, that's better. Now, look, I simply can't bear the thought of your not having a dinner date on a great day like this, Mr. LeBlanc. Why not have dinner with me, and we'll observe Cette à la femme de Dubourset just as it's being celebrated in your native village. You mean it? Oh, merci, merci. You have made me very happy. Oh, mademoiselle, I kiss your hand, please. <laughs> oh, oh, but perhaps I'm being selfish, Miss Brooks. Perhaps you don't like this kissing. I don't. Usted loco blendo francais. <laughs> Pardon? That's Spanish, meaning, oh, you crazy mixed-up Frenchman. <laughs> Since uh, c'est à la fin de divorce means it is the woman's turn to pay, Miss Brooks will pay my dinner check. <laughs> but blissfully unaware and broke, having just blown her last 45 cents on the blue plate lunch, Armis Brooks has joined the bashful biologist at his table in the school cafeteria. Her opening remark was clearly designed to ignite the fires of jealousy. I have a dinner date with Mr. LeBlanc. <laughs> Gosh, I'm certainly envious, Miss Brooks. You are, Mr. Boynton? Are you? Naturally. To think that I haven't enough money for dinner, you two will be eating like pigs. <laughs> You romantic fool, you. <laughs> In view of the many dates we've had, I should think you'd show some resentment at my dating another man. Resentment? Why? Well, because that's why. I happen to have feelings. Don't you realize that I'm a woman? A girl? Well, that's a silly thing to ask me, Miss Brooks. I knew you were a girl the first day I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> what tipped you off, Mr. Boynton? <laughs> Was I wearing pink booties? <laughs> now, now, look, let's not be sarcastic. Let me simply say that I'm very happy for you and Mr. LeBlanc. Me? I couldn't even afford to buy myself lunch. It's that bad? Oh, well, incidentally, this blue plate special I ordered will go to waste, I'm afraid. Unless perhaps you'd be interested in it, would you? Would I? <laughs> Thanks. Gosh, a hot bologna sandwich with chicken fat. Boy, I love it. <laughs> Say, that's Walter Denton heading this way, Miss Brooks. I'll pull over a chair for him. 
Greetings, oh, fairest flower in Madison's garden. Who <laughs> would I were a bumblebee that I could spend my hours busily buzzing about your blooming beauty? <laughs> Comb the bees out of your teeth and sit down, Junior. You mercy beaucoup, senorita. Aaron go bra, Fräulein. <laughs> Well, Miss Brooks and I were just discussing her dinner date with Mr. LeBlanc, Walter. Well, some people can afford to eat, and some can't, I always say. And here I am without a farthing to my name. My pop's away on a business trip, and my mom's going to the campfire girls' meeting tonight with Mrs. Conklin and Harriet. Hence, I shall have to scrounge around the kitchen seeking tiny morsels with which the flies may not yet have fled. <laughs> I'm in the same boat. I'm afraid we'll go hungry tonight, Walter. Unless someone invites us to dinner. Say, that's a brilliant idea, Miss Brooks. Pardon? <laughs> you suppose we join you and Mr. LeBlanc at La Martinique? Huh? Well, I don't believe Mr. LeBlanc would care for that idea. Well, would it be all right with you, Miss Brooks? Well, yes. Well, oh, if it's know. okay with you, I'm sure it'll be okay with Mr. LeBlanc. Just ask him. If he says no, okay. Fair enough? Fair enough. I'll run up to his classroom. See you, Walter. Bye, Mr. Boynton. Bye now. Mr. Boynton, when I say goodbye, must you leave my hands dangling in midair? Oh. Oh, gosh. I had no idea you wanted me to kiss your hand. Well, it's my fault. I should have dipped it in chicken fat. <laughs> If it is all right with you, Miss Brooks, it is certainly all right with me. Oh, thank you, Mr. LeBlanc. Believe me, one's money cannot be better spent than on food for those who are hungry. <laughs> believe me, I believe you. <laughs> You're so kind, so unselfish. I know you'd hoped we'd be dining alone, Mr. LeBlanc, just the two of us. You and me. <laughs> we. Us and... <laughs> but now, with Walter and Mr. Boynton, there'll be quite a group. Well, if that is your wish, it is mine also. The more, the merrier. You know, Miss Brooks, in my native village, the celebrants of Cesar la Fin de Divorcée are already swinging into an evening of mad revelry. Evening? Oui. Uh, between here and my homeland, you see, there is a six-hour difference in time. They are merely making us be gone. Ah, uh, but we will catch up with them. Nous célébrerons cette occasion dans un vrai style parisien. Oh, oui. <laughs> ah, ce sera une nuit dont je me souviendrai longtemps. Oui, oui. Et pour cela, je vous devrai une affection et une gratitude éternelle. Oui, oui. <laughs> fight it out on this line if it takes all winter. <laughs> je dois vous remercier d'avoir tout facilité. Oui. <laughs> oui, oui. Whoops. <laughs> In conversing with the Frenchman, Miss Brooks, an occasional no is advisable. Why, Mr. Conklin, I didn't hear you come in, sir. Uh, I had an idea these new rubber soles would pay off. <laughs> uh, excuse me, Mr. Conklin, I must go to the cloakroom to sharpen dispensers for my next class. Uh, you go sharpen them, Miss Brooks. I'd like a word with Mr. LeBlanc. Uh, but... On your horse, mademoiselle. <laughs> yeah, sahib. Uh, now then. My wife and daughter are to attend the campfire girls' meeting this evening, Mr. LeBlanc. I must therefore make plans for dinner. Uh, dinner? The we. You and me. Us. I hate to dine alone, so I thought you and I might find a nice cafeteria and go Dutch treat. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Conklin, but I, I have already been spoken for. Uh, that is, uh, I am to have dinner with Miss Brooks, along with Mr. Boynton and Walter Denton, and it will be her treat. Her treat? Mm -hmm. You mean you're going to stick a woman with the check? Oh, no, it, it is a quaint custom in my whole land, you see. Uh, this is the day of Cette à la Femme de Débossé, which means it is the woman's turn to pay. Besides, it will not harm Miss Brooks, for uh, she will pay the check with found money. Yesterday, she found a hundred dollars. Nevertheless, when the priceless heritage of Yankee chivalry is so shamelessly and wantonly a hundred dollars, you say? <laughs> 
luscious French dinner come to our the conflict. I think that's the holiday, but... So this is the fabulous La Martinique. Kill Swanky Joint. I can't make head or tail of this menu. Everything's in French. Miss Brooks alone will read the menu, Mr. Boynton. Pardon? <laughs> On set à la fin de divorce day, it is the custom that the woman shall order for the party. Garçon? Uh, oui, monsieur, at your service. Uh, Miss Brooks will order for the group, Garçon. Go on, mademoiselle. Oh, uh, oui, senor. Monsieur. <laughs> well, now, let's see. It's an interesting menu, isn't it? Say, this sounds very nice. Garage gratuit à l'arrière. Hey, madame, that means free parking in the rear. <laughs> uh, yes, sounds very nice. <laughs> Let's remember to pull in there next time, Mr. Conklin. Uh, oui, oui, Miss Brooks. But what shall we eat? Well, I'm working on that. Let's see now. Cochon Provençal. Uh, garçon. Uh, oui, madame. How, I hope I shouldn't say where, is the Cochon Provençal? Oh, that is delicious. T take it easy, Miss Brooks. That's listed on the menu at $4. Oh, I hadn't noticed. Do you mind, Mr. LeBlanc? Uh, me? Oh, not at all, my dear. Uh, just remember... <laughs> Oh, fine. Well, we'll have five orders of that, garçon. <laughs> oh, excellent. You will please do the honors of pouring the cognac, Monsieur Leblanc. Cognac? Oh, when we came in, Miss Brooks, I mentioned to the waiter that we are celebrating Sada la Femme de Dibosse Day. He knows that on this day it is customary to serve cognac before the meal. Oh, of course, I plumb forgot. <laughs> well, just pour three of them, Mr. Leblanc. Walter and I will drink plain water. Down the hatch, as they say, gentlemen. Uh, I propose a toast to our host. To Miss Brooks, who is so kind to us on this day of Fête à la Femme de Dépossé, which, as we all know, means it is the woman's turn to pay. <laughs> uh, what, what happened? I bit my glass. Well, I don't get it, Miss Brooks. Every time the waiter tries to present the check, you order more food. Uh, yes, w what are you so nervous about? Me? Who's nervous? I'm not nervous. You check me down. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, not yet, Garcon. I see it's only 5.45. <laughs> Bring us some crepe Suzette. Well done. Pour another round of cognac, Mr. LeBlanc. None for us. I, I don't drink, you know. Oh, oh but you, you ordered crepe Suzette, Miss Brooks. They are cooked in cognac, you know. Are they? Oh, well, I suppose it's better to have eaten crepe Suzette than never to have gotten loaded at all. <laughs> Now, see here, Miss Brooks, I couldn't for the life of me eat another morsel. If you persist in stalling the check... Stalling I... the check? Don't be absurd. It's six o'clock, I see. Fine. You may leave the check on the table, Garçon, and come back in a few minutes. Uh, oui, madame, as you wish. Well, gentlemen, I'm delighted that you all enjoyed yourselves. And now I have a little speech. A speech, Miss Brooks? Splendid. Speech! Uh, speech, speech! speech. <laughs> gentlemen... Because of a six-hour time difference, the time in Mr. LeBlanc's native village is now one minute after midnight. And since Cette à la Femme de Debrousse Day is over, here is the check and a happy day after Cette à la Femme de Debrousse Day to you all. <laughs> I'm Miss Brooks, telling you about and transcribed. This producer directed by Larry Burns. Written by Joe Quillen with the music of Wilbur Hatch. Mr. Thompson was played by Gail Gordon. Others in tonight's cast were Dick Crenna, Jane Morgan, Bob Rockwell, Gloria McMillan, Maurice Marsak, and Peter Lees. Now, Anison, the tablets thousands of physicians and dentists recommend for fast relief of pain of headache, neuritis, neuralgia, 
and Heat, the liniment that's strong yet does not burn, present our Miss Brooks, starring Eve Arden. <laughs> it's time once again for another comedy episode of Our Miss Brooks Transcribed. But first, if you suffer from the pains of a headache, we urge you to try the remarkable product this program features, Anison. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. The relief these tablets bring is not only effective, but often incredibly fast. Many of you I know first discovered Anison through your own dentist or physician. But if you have not yet used Anison, we urge you to try these tablets the next time you are in pain from a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted with the results. Try Anison on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want, as fast as you want it, return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison at any drug counter. It's A-N-A-C-I-N. Easy to take Anison tablets come in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family size bottles of 50 and 100. Well, the majority of our public schools start their fall semesters tomorrow, but our Miss Brooks, who teaches English at Madison High School, decided to go back last Friday. At breakfast, her landlady asked the reason. Why are you going down to school this morning, Connie? Oh, I don't know, Mrs. Davis. There are several reasons, I guess. I like to get my desk in order and see that the blackboards are all clean and ready. Uh, besides, I won't be the only teacher at school this morning. A certain biology laboratory has to be put in shape for the coming term, too. Mm, I see. And there's a certain biology teacher going to do the putting in shape? That's right. A certain male biology teacher? Mm-hmm. A certain male biology teacher named Philip Boynton? Whee! <laughs> I might have known. <laughs> you get a different look when you just start thinking of him. A sort of golden light floods your eyes at the mention of his name. It's like somebody's... What other principal has a better chance? The job requires tact, charm, diplomacy, and intelligence. Do you really think you've got a chance, Osgood? <laughs> I, I, I mean, if you are selected, when will you find out about it? Probably within the next few days. That's why I'm going into school today to clean up my office top to bottom. Never know when the head of the board might drop in. Oh, but that suit you've got on. It's practically in tatters. Well, what do you expect me to wear around dirty desks and dusty files? My frock coat? <laughs> now, if you'll excuse me, my dear, I'll trot along to school. Well, don't walk too fast, dear. Remember what Dr. Frank said. While you're on your diet, you mustn't exercise too strenuously. Dr. Frank. It's Dr. Frank's fault that I've got to take off all this weight. What do you mean? Well, if he hadn't cleared up my ulcer three years ago, I'd never have gotten so stout. <laughs> well, well, food isn't everything. Oh, before you go, dear, I'd like to ask a favor. Yes? Lucy Snodgrass phoned a little while ago and told me her washing machine is broken. Naturally, I offered to put her laundry in with ours this afternoon. Well, that should make our laundry very happy. <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? Well, Stretch Snodgrass, Lucy's boy, is coming down to school today to clean up the gym. He'll put the bundle in your office, and I'd like you to bring it home for me. A charming assignment. <laughs> well, I'm leaving, Martha. Uh, you may kiss me now. Thank you, dear. At ease. <laughs> Here we are at school. Dear old Madison. Oh, it's just heavenly to see your ivy-covered walls once again. Steady, girl, steady. <laughs> you know, school isn't so bad when you just volunteer to come. I'd better get right into Daddy's office and start cleaning up. What's your hurry, kids? It's a beautiful day. Why don't we sit out here in the sun together and chat for a while? If you say so, Miss Brooks. Oh, good morning, folks. Mr. Boynton. So long, kids. Come on, you can give me a hand with the closet. You okay, my sweet? Adios, dear teachers. Goodbye, Walter. Well, Miss Brooks, are you all ready to plunge into another school semester? All I've got to do is hold my nose and jump in. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Boynton? Oh, I'm looking forward to it. 
But I have heard some rather disturbing rumors lately. Rumors? Yes. I heard that there's going to be some kind of a shake-up in the faculty this term. I hope it doesn't affect any of the teachers I know. Like whom, Mr. Barnum? Well, like Mr. DeWitt or Mr. Norman or Miss Enright. Oh. Of course, I didn't mention the one person whose dismissal would affect me the most. And whose is that? <laughs> Mine. <laughs> well, I couldn't afford to stay out of work for any length of time. It would work a considerable hardship on my family. They'd have to send me even more money than they do now. My goodness. To hear you talk, anyone would think you were some kind of helpless moron instead of a brilliant, handsome, personable, capable scientist. Who, me? Yes, you. That's the way you should consider yourself always. What do you suppose would happen if you lost your job here at Madison? Do you think you'd have to pack your clothes in a bindle and become a hobo? Do you think you'd have to shuffle through life like this, this poor tramp coming toward us? Well, no, but... I should say you wouldn't. Why, you... Oh, excuse me, Mr. Boynton. I just got to give this poor old bum a few cents. Uh, here you are, my good man. Get yourself a bowl of hot soup. No, thanks. <laughs> I just had breakfast. Mr. Conklin. Oh, please forgive me, sir. I, I didn't recognize you in that old suit. <laughs> I am wearing it because I have a lot of cleaning up to do today. Uh, of course, sir. Miss Brooks didn't mean to uh, No, be... she never does. <laughs> uh, now, you'll excuse me? Oh, here you are, Daddy. I found this bundle of laundry in your office. Know anything about it? Yes, yes, Harriet. It belongs to Mrs. Snodgrass. I'm taking it home to your mother this afternoon. Now, for heaven's sake, let's get into school and clean out my desk. Yes, Daddy. See you later, folks. All right, Harriet. Did you hear that, Mr. Boynton? He's going in to clean out his desk. And those old clothes he was wearing. And taking laundry home to his wife. He must be the one to drive shaft sticking out of an open manhole. <laughs> well, it takes all kinds of drivers to make a world, don't I? Uh, how's Mr. Conklin been acting lately, Walter? Oh, awful. Even for him. Harriet told me yesterday he's been tense and irritable all week long. Well, that's par for the course, isn't it? What do you suppose he's worried about? You got me. All I know is that with the school term starting on Monday, he'll probably make our lives a... Walter. Inferno's the word I had in mind. Well, that's a little cooler. <laughs> now, here's the house, Miss Brooks. I'll go up on the porch and get Harriet, Miss Brooks. You wait right here. All right, Walter. Tell Harriet to hurry. It's almost a quarter after point. A ten. <laughs> Hi, Walter. You timed it just right. Hi, Harriet. Hello, Mrs. Conklin. Good morning, Walter. It's very sweet of you to call for Harriet like this. It's a labor of love, Mrs. Conklin. Is old Marble... <laughs> Is Mr. Conklin going with us? Well, I don't know if he's quite ready, Walter. Uh, just a moment, I'll call him. Oh, I'm good. Do you want to ride down to school? Who's driving? I am, Mr. Conklin. Me, sir. Me, Walter Denton. Me, walk. <laughs> well, it's just as well Daddy's been in a pretty bad mood lately The walk will do him good Okay, let's get started, Harriet See you later, Mrs. Conklin Bye, Mother I'll be back as soon as I help Daddy get Madison organized All right, dear Have they gone? Yes, Osgood Good There's something I'd like to tell you about, my dear Something I wouldn't want blabbed all over town Oh, now, Osgood, that's no way to talk about your own daughter. Harriet never gossiped. I was not referring to Harriet. I'm talking about her idiot consort. <laughs> if there ever was a marblehead, it's that boy. <laughs> <laughs> However, what I wanted you to know is that your husband, Osgood Conklin, principal, may soon be Osgood Conklin, assistant supervisor of schools in this area. No. Well, it's not definite, of course. As a matter of fact, I just read of my predecessor's transfer. But it shouldn't take the board long to pick out his successor. Do you really think you've got a chance, Osgood? Chance? Stuck a fork into two poached eggs. <laughs> <laughs> what a pretty thought, Mrs. Davis. But I am fond of the bashful brute. Oh, pass the cream, please. Yeah. Here you are, dear. Thanks. 
Oh, may I have the sugar, please? Here it is. If only he'd come out of his shell. He's so retiring. He doesn't seem to realize how handsome and charming he is. Now, now, please, Connie, stop thinking about Mr. Boynton. It's preventing you from eating a proper breakfast. What? What makes you say that? You've just drunk a cup of sugar and cream without coffee. (laughs) Well, no wonder it tasted so sweet and white. But there's something else that's been on my mind lately. I ran into some teachers the other day, and there's a rumor that some changes are going to be made in our faculty. Oh, nonsense, Connie. These silly rumors start flying around before every new term. Why, down at the ladies' league luncheon the other day, I even heard that Mr. Conklin might be leaving Madison. What? But without Mr. Conklin as our principal, Madison wouldn't be... Well, it just wouldn't be a high school anymore. What would it be? A paradise. (laughs) I mean, who told you about his leaving? Nobody told me. It was just mentioned in passing, along with a lot of other scuttle, uh, if you'll excuse the expression, but... (laughs) What a charming colloque, if you'll excuse the expression, queerism. (laughs) I guess I'll find out more about the situation at school today. Walter Denton's driving me down this morning. Oh, what's wrong with your car? I had a little trouble with the drive shaft yesterday. What happened to it? It fell down an open manhole. It was nice of you to pick me up this morning, Walter. It is a labor of love, oh fair one. Besides, I promised to help Harriet Conklin get things straightened out at school. Oh, is Harriet coming in today, too? Yes, ma'am. I'm picking her up on our way down. She always likes to help old Marblehead, I mean, her dad, get things ready before school officially opens. Yes, I know, but how come she isn't driving down with him? There are cars in the repair shop. The bottom of the motor's all ripped up. Seems some idiot left...